Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidkoper and today I'd like to tell you the story of the death of Marat. That's this iconic painting made by Jacques-Louis David in 1793. It is this haunting image of a man who's just been murdered, who is, was actually a friend of David's and who had been killed in the incredible mess that we now call the French Revolution. And I feel I should warn you that this is a story that's about a lot of violence and death. So probably a bit less cheerful than some of my other videos. The painting itself has been hailed as David's most powerful painting and as the first real modernist work of art. He managed to make this modern figure, that's, that's a contemporary figure to him, look like a hero of mythology. He's a, a martyr saint. He even reminds us a little bit of, um, of Christ in a Pietà, except for the bathtub, obviously. But if you look at the head, and of course in the wound in his chest, it, it even looks a little bit like the wound in the side of Christ. He made Marat's death heroic, and him a hero for it. And I'll tell you the story behind it, and then you can decide for yourself if you agree with the idea of him being a hero or not. But I usually start off by telling you something about the artist, which in this case makes more sense than usual, because not only did he make this painting, he more or less took part in the events, and he was almost a witness to all of this. And as I said, he was a friend of Marat. Jacques-Louis David was one of the prominent painters of the age. Like all major painters of his time, he had worked, or tried very hard, to work for the French court, that is, before the Revolution. And he had had some success there as a portrait painter. But he was much more interested in the neoclassical movement that was gradually taking over. Many of his previous works were about subjects from ancient Rome. And he was very much against the Rococo style that had been all the rage when he was young. He had gotten into trouble with his teachers and, and the academy for rejecting Rococo. And, well, by the way, if you're not familiar, Rococo was that very ornamental style, very theatrical, you might say. And in paintings, these sort of fêtes galantes were very popular, where people in beautiful dress just sort of run around in gardens, usually surrounded by little cupids and, and stuff. Uh, this one's a good example. David was looking for a much more stern and direct form of art, very much inspired by the Romans. And it was really becoming more popular because of the stuff people started to find in Pompeii during the 18th century. It really brought back interest in Roman civilization and Roman life. So this, for instance, is one of the most famous paintings that David had made before, which is the Oath of the Horaci. It's, a, it's one of those stern Roman subjects about three brothers who are going to fight the three lovers of their three sisters. But that's a subject for a different video. But I'm sure you can see the difference between the two styles. But it's more than just a difference in style. It's also a shift in subject matter from the sort of frivolous to the much more serious. Well, this neoclassicism became the new fashion and the main new style. And David arguably was one of the reasons that it became that, because he was a really prominent painter by the late 1780s. And then 1798 rolled around and the storming of the Bastille happened, and the French Revolution took shape. Many painters at the time moved to different countries, because with no royal court or aristocracy, many quite reasonably thought that there would be fewer clients to commission work from them. But David stayed and he became politically active. He became part of the more fanatical movement within the revolution. He was a friend of Robespierre, and so was Marat. The three of them actually sat together at the first assembly of the Assemblée Nationale, or the National Convention. Now, 1793, the year that Marat was killed, had started off violently. In January of 1793, they executed Louis XVI. He had been deposed long before, but allowed to stay relatively free. But in 1792, he tried to escape to the Austrian Netherlands, that is, today's Belgium. And he had tried to get his brother-in-law, who just happened to be the Austrian emperor, uh, to back him to get back on the throne. When he was captured at the border, it led to his arrest and eventually to his execution. And the National Convention actually had to vote whether or not to execute him. And both David and Marat voted for the execution. In the case of David, this had some personal consequences as well, because his wife divorced him because of it. She was a royalist. And ironically, divorce had only been legalized through the revolution. 
Now, understandably, ever since the revolution started, there had been different factions that tried to decide the future of the French government. Obviously, not everybody agreed with one another and there was a lively political debate. Some argued for the return of the monarchy from the very beginning in some form or another. Of course, then with more power given to a parliament, but others were for a radical change and a republic without any kind of king. In the National Convention, there were these different factions. You might now call them political parties. And amongst them were the Girondins, who were the more moderate and who held the majority for a, quite a long time. And then there were the Montagnards, who were much more radical. And it was this last group, the Montagnards, that Marat and David belonged to. They the Montagnards, I mean, they claimed that there were real physical dangers to the revolution, that there were armies about to attack them from other countries and from within France itself. And they claimed that the revolution needed to protect itself from them. And the fact that they apprehended the king was a clear indication that at least to some extent they were right. And it wasn't just Louis XVI who wanted to return to power. Many countries in Europe might well want to assist him because there were quite a few countries that did not like the idea of a revolution, especially with the threat of it spreading to their countries as well. And within France, there were also people who were against the idea of revolution and in favor of a monarchy. And those were therefore enemies of the revolution. And from the very beginning of the revolution, they had started to imprison these so-called enemies. And as we all know, eventually they would start to execute all these people with guillotines. And in all of this, both David and Marat were active participants, and they were not about to calm things down. But who was this Marat? Well, his name is Jean-Paul Marat, and he was a physician, a writer, a political theorist, and to some extent a, a scientist, and a journalist. Because in 1789, he started publishing a newspaper called L'Ami du Peuple, or The Friend of the People. He wrote extensively about the virtues of equality and of liberty and of friendship. Um, so basically the, the virtues of the revolution. And he was a staunch defender of the more radical side of the revolution that opposed any type of return of the Bourbon, but also of the more violent tendencies within it. For instance, he's widely held responsible for the September massacre of 1792. This was when a group of royalist supporters and soldiers that had been imprisoned were murdered in their prison for fear of them breaking out and starting a counter-revolution. And although all of this is obviously inexcusable to kill prisoners without any form of a trial, it illustrates that the fears of a counter-revolution were very real. And for instance, on the day before Louis XVI was to be executed, a man called Michel Louis de Le Pelletier was murdered by a former bodyguard of the king because Le Pelletier had voted for the execution. Now this was in January of 1793, and David made a painting of this as well, but it was later destroyed by Le Pelletier's daughter because she was a royalist. So tensions were very high and, and nothing seemed to calm them down. And both parties started to use more violence against each other. A few months later in May and in June, the Montagnards really started to take power and they overthrew the Girondins. And the leaders of the Girondins were quickly imprisoned and later executed. And this, many historians call the beginning of the reign of terror. Now, I've stressed before that Marat was part of all this, and I wasn't exaggerating. He had been one of the most vocal opponents of the Girondins. He had called for violence on them, and they had, at some point, had him arrested and tried on the suspicion that he used his paper to incite murder and other forms of violence against them. But he was acquitted. But he also left the National Convention for personal and medical reasons. Now, on the 13th of July of 1793, he was at home, working from home in a bathtub. He actually often did that because he suffered from a skin disease and some sort of medicinal baths helped apparently. And because he did this all the time, he rigged up some sort of desk in his bath. And he was apparently working on an edition of his paper. Then a woman by the name of Charlotte Corday came and she asked for an audience with him. She had brought him a petition to sign. It was a list of people in her hometown of Cannes that she claimed were enemies of the revolution. Now they talked for about 15 minutes and when they were done, she got up. Later she would testify that he said that the people on the list, their heads would roll within a fortnight, which is unlikely because he didn't have any power to make that happen. But that's what she said to the police. But then she took a knife that she had hidden under her clothing, 
that she apparently had bought that day and she stabbed him and one stab was enough to cut an artery and he was dead very quickly. She didn't flee, she waited for the police, was arrested and executed only four days later. It was later revealed that she was a Girondin sympathizer during her very short trial and she said she had killed one man but saved a hundred thousand others. Now, although David was not at the scene, he was there shortly after. And also, he used the police report for details of the painting. And that helps to give the painting the effect of an eyewitness account, as if it were some sort of crime scene photograph. Even though the idea of a crime scene photograph, of course, didn't exist yet. I mean, photographs themselves had not been invented yet. Now, you can see that in his hand, he holds this petition that she came to give him. And on it, we can read the date and her name and underneath a request for help. We see his writing material and his arm is lying on a copy of his paper that he was working on. That copy actually still exists and it is still stained with his blood. There's also blood in the bathwater which has turned red. We can even see the murder weapon lying on the ground next to him. But then he also took several liberties to make the picture more effective. For instance, he removed a lot of clutter. The entire wall next to Marat is empty when the police report stated that there was a shelf there with books on it. Also, he looks very peaceful, as if there had been no struggle at all. And there's very little blood. The wound is very clean, and he has just the right amount of muscle tone to make him look more like a classical sculpture. Also, he left out all the evidence of his skin disease, because in reality his skin had been covered in scabs. The painting took him several months to finish, and then it was presented by David, not to the salon, which would be the normal place to do it, but to the National Convention. But before he started working on the painting, David arranged a funeral for Marat. He was to be buried in the Pantheon in Paris. And before that, he was laid out in state on a Roman bed with an arm hanging out like this on the painting, still holding a quill. And from the very moment that Marat was killed, David had decided to make him a martyr of the revolution, which is actually a title that was later given to Marat. There is, by the way, another painting of this subject, made 57 years later, that looks upon it from a different angle. It's this one by Paul Jacques Aimé Baudry, simply called Charlotte Corday. It seems to look at the whole incident differently. Obviously, it's from a different angle. We see the small room that the murder took place in, but it also shows a different angle on the story here. Here, Charlotte Corday is, is the hero of the story who tried to prevent the reign of terror as apparently that was what she thought she was doing. However, it also shows us how very powerful the image by David is, mostly because he left so much out, because the image is so empty and it just focuses on the important part of the story. Of course, in his day, everybody knew that this was personal to him. So above his signature, it says A Marat, or For Marat, making it a tribute to the man and his friend. After this, the revolution went on. It became an even bloodier mess than it had been. Eventually, Napoleon took over, and after his fall, David went into exile in Brussels. Many of his paintings were now in danger of being destroyed, and one of his pupils, Antoine Gros, helped to hide them. This painting eventually made it back to David in Brussels, where you can still see it in the Museum of Fine Arts in Belgium, in Brussels. And of course, there's lots of reasons to go and visit Brussels. This is just one of them. But before you go, this is that time where I remind you that you could subscribe to my channel, you could leave a like if you enjoyed this video, and you might even, if you really want to help me, share this video with whomever might be interested. In any case, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.